Well, welcome everybody to HydroTerra's latest webinar. Today, we're joined by Mitchell Brennan and Andrew Nickham. We're going to talk to us about pioneering marine science for a sustainable future. What is being done to revive Sydney's seas? I'd like to start by some acknowledgements. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we conduct our work across this great land. And for that privilege, we would like to thank the traditional owners. Hydroterra respectfully acknowledges the Boon Wurrung people of the Kulin Nation, where we are located today. And we pay our respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. There's a picture of one of our presenters, this is Mitch. I don't have a picture for Andrew today. Thanks very much for presenting today. A little bit about our presenters. So Mitchell Brennan is a PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney and Research Institute at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. Mitchell's research is focused on the conservation of threatened marine species and ecosystems, primarily the endangered whitehorse seahorse hypocampus white eye, I've forgotten how to pronounce that, and its associated habitats. Mitchell leads the Sydney Seahorse Project at SIMS, which focuses on optimizing the conservation methodologies for the white seahorse through the implementation of a conservation stocking program and habitat restoration. Mitchell also works on Project Restore, which aims to restore degraded habitats in Sydney Harbour with a focus on fish habitat enhancement. Mitch is the New South Wales representative on the Australian Society of Fish Biology Threatened Species Committee the student representative on the Australian Marine Science Association, New South Wales branch, and a member of the IUCN Commission on Ecosystem Management. Our other presenter, Andrew Nickham, is the Facility and Technical Services Manager at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. He is a marine biologist and technical scientist with 14 years of diverse research experience at various university and government organisations in five countries. Andrew oversees SIMS research projects and facilities, including laboratories, research aquarium, and vessels to enable successful research outcomes for SIMS partners programs and facility users from all disciplines of marine science. So a couple of really good presenters here today. I uh, learned a little bit about Andrew before the start. He's spent some interesting time in Hawaii and did his original studies in North Carolina, a place called Wilmington. Um, less about Mitch, other than I understand he's one of the rising stars of Sims and um, looking forward to hearing from both of you. Before we get started, we love your questions. And to raise questions, you use the Q&A button and we will read those questions out at the end of the presentation after we've done the early bird questions. Thanks very much to all of you who sent in early bird questions. Why does HydroTerra do these webinars? There's a few reasons. We like to share knowledge. We like to facilitate education and we like to be an industry leader. HydroTerra is getting more involved in marine monitoring these days. So it's also great for us to be building our knowledge of the application of those monitoring technologies. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Andrew and I will stop sharing. Thank you, Richard. Uh, can you guys see that all right? Yep. Beautiful. 
Okay. Thanks very much for having me, everyone. Um, and thanks for that uh, lovely introduction, Richard. Much appreciated. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Aora Nation, uh, where Mitch and I are presenting from, uh, the traditional custodians of the land um, from where we're joining you virtually. Um, I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and to all Indigenous people. So I'm going to start just by giving you guys a brief overview of Sims and then hand over to Mitch to tell you about some of our really cool projects that he's running for us. Um, so Sims is quite a unique organization. Um, we were established in 2005, so we're quite young relative to research organizations. We have a strong focus on multidisciplinary collaboration and, and engendering collaboration across organizations and disciplines of marine science. Um, we are classed as a nonprofit, and I'll talk a little bit more in the next slide about our funding scheme. But uh, one thing that I think is really special about SIMS from a research perspective is that in terms of our facility and our uh, facility infrastructure and the way that we support science, uh, we um, function on a non-commercial basis. So we feel very strongly about not profiting off of science, but proliferating it. Um, and that's quite a special and unique thing relative to research today. Um, we have world-class research facilities. Um, that's not laughable, it's true, but um, yeah, it seems uh, quite superlative to, to say it out loud, but we are quite proud of our facilities and I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about them. Um, and yeah, we're the, I'd say we're the premier research organization, marine research organization in New South Wales. We have unique facilities that bring us researchers nationally and internationally as well. So let's go into a bit more detail. So SIMS was originally started by the four big Sydney unis, um, UNSW, Macquarie Uni, University of Sydney, and UTS. Um, so they still provide our primary operational funding. Um, and the, the whole idea of that is that they're funding us as an infrastructure facility for uh, research and collaboration. And then that allows us to provide these facilities and to facilitate research at heavily subsidized rates. As many of you might know, uh, funding in science is hard to come by, especially in environmental science. And believe it or not, marine science is one of the smallest portions of environmental science funding. So working at an organization where we can help researchers to make the most of their grant funding um, is quite a cool thing to be a part of. Um, we also have quite a few associate members and partners. Um, associate members would be, um, you know, the Office of Environment and Heritage, New South Wales National Parks, Australian Museum, now DQ, um, and then some more direct partners that we have, uh, the Department of Primary Industries Fisheries for New South Wales. So all the Sydney-based managers and researchers for DPI Fisheries New South Wales are based here on site with us at SIMS. And then SIMS also acts as the New South Wales node for IMOS, which is the Integrated Marine Observing System. Um, those of you uh, that I guess are more involved with HydroTerra would probably know that uh, IMOS is uh, supplied with quite a few of their fantastic sensor systems by um, some HydroTerra subsidiaries, which is actually how I ended up here today. Um, so I'll go into a bit more detail about that down the track, but essentially, IMOS is a national program and SIMS operates all of the New South Wales based facilities for IMOS. So here's my uh, tilted picture of uh, our site. If you ask why it's tilted, then I'll tell you that it's to test your seaworthiness and that I'm using it for recruiting purposes, um, not a lack of IT skills. Um, anyways, just for a quick overview of our facilities. So I think one of the really cool things about SIMS and what makes us a highly convenient place for marine science is that we're based right here in beautiful Chowder Bay. Um, SIMS effectively functions as a non-remote field station for marine research uh, based in Sydney. Um, I like to frame it in that way because I spent the majority of my career before SIMS at remote field stations um, in different places around the world. and. You know, a field station is, in its most basic form, a roof over your head in the environment that you want to study. Um, you know, they could be 
you know, I've worked in field stations that have no running water and limited electricity. So, you know, at minimum, you're using it as a, a place to live while you survey the local area. If you're lucky, you may have some additional infrastructure to, you know, bring samples back home or to carry out some kind of analyses um, while you're there. What's special about SIMS is that we have all of the access to the marine environment that we um, are working to study, but then we have the infrastructure of this, the city to support fully modern research labs, a research aquarium, et cetera, et cetera. So um, just for a quick virtual tour, um, this is our main administration building uh, where Mitch and I are joining you from. Um, here's DPI Fisheries main administration building. Next door to them, we have our biology labs, which cater to cell, uh, micro, molecular biology. We've got a small microscopy room as well. Upstairs is where the animal tracking facility is based, one of the programs that we run for IMOS, which I'll talk more about in a minute. In a minute. Um, and then around the corner here, we have our fisheries and field lab, where all the dirty science happens and all of the skeletal chronology and things that uh, fisheries uses to manage fish populations. Um, and then downstairs from that is our ecotoxicology and analytical chemistry lab. Um, here on the water is our flow through aquarium. Um, it's quite a special system where we pump water directly out of the harbor. It flows through all of our experimental systems and then back into the harbor. Um, again, I'll talk a bit more about that later. And then we've got a boat shed and the pump house here. The boat shed is highly convenient because we can launch and retrieve our small vessels um, straight from the harbor, um, which just cuts down on a bit of the logistics and bureaucracy um, of fieldwork planning and paperwork and things. So that's highly convenient as well. Going into a bit more detail, I did pretty well cover off the labs and the purposes they serve. Um, here's just a quick insight to those. Um, so just going into a bit more detail here. So this is our um, ecotoxicology and analytical chemistry lab. Um, we do a lot of work on uh, biotoxin analysis and research. So uh, many of you have probably heard of harmful algal blooms. And you may also know that uh, the incidence of these is increasing with global warming. Um, so we do a, we've been for many years doing research and identifying these novel biotoxins. Um, Many of these toxins are postulated to be the most potent toxins by mass known to man. Um, and when they get into ecosystems as a result of bioaccumulation, they can harm local ecosystems and then they can get into food systems as well and harm humans. Um, so that research is um, quite interesting, not only from a molecular perspective, but it's quite uh, meaningful in terms of, you know, protecting food safety. And we do quite a bit of work with um, New South Wales food regulators to make sure that, you know, uh, fish crops and things when they're going to market are safe for consumption. The research aquarium is really sort of um, the bread and butter of our facility. Sorry, I just realized I was pointing on my uh, uh, info deck. So we have sort of two major sections of the research aquarium. The outdoor experimental area, like the entire aquarium, is built uh, for utilitarian purposes. So within the aquarium and within our systems, we really specialize at SIMS and with my team of technical scientists and consulting with researchers and designing uh, novel research experiments. So everything is uh, built to be broken uh, and rebuilt again to suit the purposes of the experimental aim. Um, so, you know, we use this outdoor area. Uh, well, I guess as a general rule inside the aquarium, we're using artificial means to simulate, you know, light, uh, heat, chemistry, microbiology of seawater systems, et cetera, et cetera. But for certain experiments, um, we need to do them outdoors. Uh, we need natural UV irradiance, um, particulate airborne matter, freshwater systems, perfect diurnal light cycles. So um, that's what we use that outdoor area for. Within the research aquarium itself, um, we have quite a specialized system. Um, aquatic research is extremely difficult to pull off. Um, you have all of these moving parts. You have, you know, compressors, heating elements, pumps, um, gas inclusion for chemical manipulation, et cetera, et cetera. 
And if any one of those moving parts fails overnight, then you can lose a large portion of your experiment, um, which can be quite, uh, quite a bad experience um, when you've invested money and time into it. So what's really cool about our systems is that they're automated and um, all of them go back to a building management system. Um, and then my team is on call 24 seven for the entire facility. So my team has to be across everything from the industrial pumping infrastructure to each experiment that we're running and the triage for it if something goes wrong. Um, for example, these rooms here are what we call our controlled environment rooms. And in those rooms, we have specialized systems that we use to regulate the temperature and the chemistry of the water. Um, so that allows us to simulate different environmental systems, um, modern environmental systems, but oftentimes future environmental systems as well. So that combined with our 24 seven technical support allows us to maintain experimental parameters for long periods of time. So for example, Oftentimes these days we'll be simulating future oceans, 50, 100, 150 years in the future. We'll be running experiments sometimes for years at a time um, where we're exposing animals and um, ecosystems to those future conditions. And then those long-term experiments allow us to do what we call multi-generational work. So we can allow organisms to reproduce in those future conditions and we can see how they're adapting the epigenetic effects on the offspring, et cetera, et cetera. So it's quite a specialized system. Um, that's a bit of a brief overview of it. I guess uh, Emily here is also working in one of our more specialized labs still, which is our containment facility. So SIMS has, uh, I guess, the only flow through aquatic containment facility in Australia. Um, and that water does not go back into the harbor. It goes through UV and chlorine sterilization, then gets pumped into black water or sewage treatment. Um, and that lab allows us to work with uh, invasive species, non-native species, biotoxins, pathogens, GMOs, anything that we don't want to harm our local harbor. So that's also quite a unique system. Um, giving a bit more detail about IMOS, and I'll try to power through here so that we can get to Mitch, but... um. So the Integrated Marine Observing System is a fantastic system or a fantastic uh, program. And it's essentially built for oceanographic, long-term oceanographic observation all the way around Australia. Um, as a general rule in science, you know, long-term data sets are invaluable. And many of these facilities, including many of those that we run, have been going now for uh, over 15 years, which is quite profound when it comes to the data. Um, so, you know, some of the facilities that we run from SIMS are the New South Wales aspect of the moorings facilities, um, the AUV facility, which is for automated underwater vehicles, um, and the animal tracking facility. There's about six others, but I won't try to name them all now. I'll go into a bit more detail about the animal tracking facility quickly. I was actually hoping that these guys could present today because they use a whole slew of sensor systems, as do most of the IMOS programs. Um, but this is quite a unique facility in that um, this team essentially deploys these acoustic tracking devices all the way across Australia. For example, off of Bondi Beach, we have one acoustic receiver uh, running perpendicular to the coastline every kilometer. And then we have 15 of those. So we have an array of them that stretch to 15 kilometers offshore. And then they can pick up on a signal from a tagged animal uh, from any tagged animal that's passing within approximately 15 and a half kilometers of the coastline. We also have a deployment across the headlands of the harbor so we can see what's coming and going. And then we have those arrays all the way from Mariah Island in Tasmania to Ningaloo um, in Northwest Australia so that we can track sort of large scale ecological migrations of different species. Um, the other facet of that program is we have a, um, a technician who's based in Hobart, and he does a field season every year in Antarctica um, and Macquarie Island, and he places satellite tags on elephant seals, weddell seals, crab eater seals, etc. Um, essentially, then those seals become, you know, a natural scientists for us because those satellite tags both take abiotic measurements of different oceanic parameters, and they send us back to them in real time with the location, the depth at the and the depth that the animal is at. So 
our team of SEALs from a recent literature review are providing uh, the majority, if not all of the data for almost half of the Antarctic coastline. Um, we're just working now with a lot of different meteorological organizations to get that more integrated into global meteorological um, forecasting. Um, and then those SEALs are doing amazing work for us in areas that we can't go ourselves. So for instance, a few years back, they remapped a significant portion of the Antarctic coastline and showed that the depth profile was twice as deep as anyone had known before. Last year, one of them found a tunnel uh, underneath the shelf that no one knew about before, which was quite interesting. Um, so that kind of data is coming back all the time. Um, we've expanded upon this program now, but I won't go into detail about it because I want to save plenty of time for Mitch, um, but I'd be happy to discuss it more in the questions at the end. So I guess, as I previously stated, SIMS originally started as an infrastructure facility to support uh, novel marine research. Um, these days, we're doing about 40 of those projects a year and supporting our partners and marine scientists from all over the world. So we not only subsidize research for our partners, we subsidize it for anyone who's working in marine science. And just to go back quickly, um, another really cool facet of IMOS um, that goes with our ethic in that vein is that all of the data from the IMOS programs goes back to a database called the Australian Ocean Data Network. And that database is made available to the global research public. So that's quite a, a profound move in research where people are often trying to, you know, keep the data for themselves, uh, silo it, you know, further their organizations or the, their careers. Um, we're not trying to do that. We're trying to collect data that can be made available to the research public so that um, we can, you know, further the field of marine research. So SIMS has transitioned from pure infrastructure facility that's supporting uh, novel experimental research into an organization that has many of our own unique research initiatives. Most of those initiatives are built around, um, you know, sustainable fisheries management, conservation, uh, restoration of degraded habitats, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here's a quick uh, glimpse at a lot of those projects. Um, the Gamma Initiative, uh, for example, we're trying to unify a lot of uh, sort of disparate uh, data and programs going on um, with research in Botany Bay, Botany Bay or Gamay to help to create a sort of better holistic approach and to identify key areas um, uh, via a sort of holistic ecosystem model for further work. Um, we've just been doing some really cool work applying uh, a lot of our sort of well-established uh, restoration principles at Cockatoo Island. We have this one crazy project called Marine Cloud Brightening, where we're using seawater to create and brighten clouds over the Great Barrier Reef um, to help keep it cool and stop it from bleaching. Um, we have a great program that we started this year where we're training up indigenous youth from the local area to be marine scientists, uh, helping them learn the skills they need to be technical divers and skippers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then uh, Project Kingfish is another one where we're satellite tracking kingfish, um, which have been identified as uh, a key species of uh, commercial and recreational importance um, that very little is known about their mating behaviors. Um, and then that brings us to Operation Posidonia, Operation Crayweed, uh, which are four programs that we have established methods for restoring uh, the endangered seagrass uh, Posidonia and a species of macroalgae called crayweed, uh, which is not this uh, species pictured. That's giant kelp from Tasmania, but it's just a, a really cool photo. Um, but uh, those are some of the first programs that have successfully restored degraded macroalgae and uh, seagrass habitats. Um, just as well, we have our artificial reef um, tiles, which we install on seawalls to recreate natural systems, uh, fish pods and seahorse hotels to create semi-natural fish habitats in degraded areas. And all of these programs have now established themselves such that we have this new venture called Project Restore, where we're working to restore multiple sites around the harbor uh, with uh, all of these, combining the techniques from these programs to see if the synergistic effect of them is greater than their 
uh, individual effects. Um, for example, the living seawalls have been shown to increase biodiversity in local areas by 300%. Um, with that, though, uh, uh, my colleague Mitch will now tell you a lot more detail about Project Restore and the Sydney Seahorse Project, which he runs, uh, which are two of our phenomenal uh, current projects that we're running. Um, so that was my quick and dirty intro to Sims. I hope you all enjoyed it. Um, I'll look forward to discussion after the fact. And uh, thank you very much for having me. And thanks to Richard and Jane for organizing and for the opportunity to present to your community. Thanks, Andrew. Over to you, Mitch. All right, thank you. Can you guys see that? Yep, you might want to go to full screen view though, Mitch. It's full screen on my end here. Yeah. Okay, well, let's just progress. Great, thank you. So yeah, thanks for the great introduction and thanks for having us today. Uh, yeah, my name is Mitchell Brennan, and currently I am a PhD candidate at the University of Technology, Sydney, and work here at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science. So my PhD is focused on uh, the conservation of the white seahorse, which we'll go into uh, in the next presentation. Um, but I also work here as a research assistant on a really cool uh, new project called Project Restore, and Andrew just gave you um, a bit of information about Project Restore. Um, but yeah, I'll go into it on in a little bit more detail. Um, so the project itself is very big uh, and there's a lot of different components to it, which I won't touch on today. I'll give a general overview of what the sort of bigger picture of the project is. And yeah, we can uh, answer any questions that you might have um, on how we're actually uh, aiming to do this and what our outcomes are. Uh, well, what outcomes we're hoping to achieve and how we're actually measuring this as well. Um, but yeah, this is just a general overview of what Project Restore is. So uh, thank you to Andrew and Richard for their acknowledgement um, as well. So Project Restore is part Sorry, of- Mitch. We're seeing Sydney Seahorse Project screen. Okay, I'm gonna stop share and then I'm gonna come back up. How's that? Much better. Beauty. There we go. <laughs> Great. Cool. So, yep. Haven't missed too much so far. Just uh, a scuba diver getting amongst the Posidonia there. So Project Restore is part of a bigger project called Seabirds to Seascapes. And uh, this is looking to enhance or restore um, several habitats throughout um, Sydney Harbour and some of the other components of Seabirds to Seascape include a monitoring program for um, seals and little penguins, which is being led by Taronga. And yeah, Project Restore is the component of the Seabirds to Seascape project that um, SIMS is facilitating. So our major goal is to restore and enhance the connected coastal habitats in Sydney, aiming to have positive impacts on the marine life, but also for humans as well. And the reason for this is we are currently in what is being acknowledged as generation restoration. So the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration aims to prevent, halt and reverse the degradation of ecosystems on every continent and in every ocean. Right now, we are at a point where this activity of restoration um, needs to take place. We're at a breaking point for many of these marine ecosystems. 
um, we're seeing significant declines in so many habitats, um, so many ecosystems, and as a result, we're seeing declines in species. We're seeing more species being threatened with extinction. And realistically, we're in a time frame now that positive intervention uh, needs to take place in order to um, restore or enhance uh, the damage that we've done, essentially. The natural seascape is complex. It's made up of um, a variety of different habitats, ecosystems, and an incredibly diverse uh, group of species. So in particular, within the context of Sydney Harbour, Sydney Harbour is one of the larger, largest uh, estuaries in the world, and it is characterised by this diverse mosaic of ecosystems and habitats. So as you can see on the screen currently, we have uh, these natural rocky reefs, we have sea grasses, we have uh, macroalgae dominated reefs, um, we have uh, sponge gardens, we have mangroves, mud flats. There's uh, yeah, so much, so much habitat within Sydney Harbour. However, what we're seeing today is representative of a harbour that's been heavily impacted by humans. So the seascape, particularly within these urbanised estuaries and urbanised harbours and along the coastal waters, has been significantly degraded. So these are just a few examples. Um, on the top right, you can see an artificial seawall. Sydney Harbour, for example, about 50% of the um, rocky shoreline has been modified or in... Uh, the mo <laughs> most cases, it's been destroyed and replaced by these artificial seawalls. Uh, we've seen significant declines of seagrasses at a rate of about 10% per year, leaving us with these bare sediments that um, reduces the habitat complexity that many species need to survive and subsequently reduces food and as well has impacts on um, the bigger scale in terms of where losses of carbon sequestration for one small example. We're seeing huge amounts of pollutants. Fortunately, Sydney Harbour is uh, moving in the right direction in terms of uh, it's definitely cleaner now than it has been in decades gone by, um, but the impacts have already taken place. And one key um, component is the damage that has been done through dredging um, or the installation of things such as the moorings, as you can see, a mooring block on the right there, that mooring block would have been put directly into um, a seagrass meadow, and that mooring chain uh, drags around and completely scours uh, the seafloor, removing any available habitat and subsequently impacting the species that do rely on it. So we're aiming to restore several of these uh, sites throughout Sydney Harbour. Um, currently, we have 14 selected sites throughout the harbour. Most of these are on the outer estuary. And uh, you can see some of the little icons that are associated with some of the sites, and I'll go into what those icons mean. Um, but yeah, there's several sites, and this is a before-after control impact study. So we're currently in the baseline monitoring um, surveying component of this project as a whole. But then some of these sites have been uh, chosen as reference sites. So Quarantine Beach and Milk Beach, for example, are the reference sites. And they're still relatively healthy ecosystems within the harbour. And that's kind of what our restoration outcome is aiming towards. Whereas we have sites like Little Manly, um, which will serve as a control. So we're not taking any active restoration there and seeing... Um, how that progresses without any active restoration. And then we have several sites where we're doing uh, both seascape scale restoration and single habitat scale restoration and seeing, one, if we can move these sites that are significantly degraded towards the reference sites of Quarantine Beach and Milk Beach, and two, if the combination or the combination of uh, methods within single uh, sites leads to um, more effective uh, outcomes for the ecosystem than doing single habitat by habitat um, sort of uh, restoration activities. So the project has uh, five major goals. Firstly, habitat restoration, um, including the restoration of endangered Posidonia Australis seagrass meadows. 
seaweed forest or the restoration of um, macroalgae or colonia radiata and the enhancement of artificial foreshore areas, including the living seawalls panels and reef pods. We're aiming to boost biodiversity um, by uh, in, including improving the local biodiversity and the associated ecological communities to levels at or above standard ecological benchmarks and um, including within um, reference uh, comparisons to the reference locations that I mentioned earlier. We're aiming to connect the seascapes. So by doing multiple restoration activities in the one area, we're hoping that um, we can re rehabilitate habitat connectivity between the restoration habitats and the adjacent natural habitats and encouraging or enhancing the associated benthic and pelagic communities. The project overall has a strong focus on community engagement as well, um, increasing awareness and in, and the sense of stewardship um, but, uh, for the local community, especially being in Sydney, a populace of over 5 million people. It's really important to ensure that uh, we're able to impact or change the opinions or develop the opinions and inform the general community on what's happening below the water where most people don't see and how they can make a positive difference, including through the participation in citizen science and um, metrics on employment and um, yeah, the opportunity for further uh, research and STEM. So seascape restoration um, combines the restoration methods um, to be done or performed at a, a seascape level and across multiple habitats. So Project Restore brings together four of the um, key projects or flagship projects of the Sydney Institute of Marine Science and puts them all together essentially. This includes, yeah, the kelp enhancement. So enhancing kelp forest in Sydney Harbour, um, specifically the golden kelp that you can see there, Eclonia radiata. The installation of these living seawalls panels um, which, as Andrew mentioned earlier, has significant uh, increases in the biodiversity of the benthic and uh, fish communities associated with them. And these are um, installed onto artificial inf uh, infrastructure uh, where the habitat complexity has previously been lost. The fish pods, which are an artificial uh, habitat structure placed in into or near by rocky, uh, degraded rocky reef ecosystems, where habitat complexity has declined, and enhancing the available habitat for the fish communities, and the restoration of this endangered seagrass, Posidonia australis. Um, which, as I mentioned earlier, is declining at about a rate of 10% per year within Sydney Harbour. Um, so, yeah, we're trying to restore through the replanting or the translocating of this species. So that's kind of the big picture of what the project is aiming for. And just to give you a quick glance of what we've been up to, the 14 sites that were shortlisted and ultimately chosen uh, were selected out of an original 61 sites. We've had over 140 days in the field, and uh, this is increasing by the week. We have 1,200 hours of baseline monitoring footage to determine or to assess the species composition and the biodiversity that exists within Sydney Harbour currently at each of these sites. And this is from over a 1,000 uh, GoPros being deployed into the harbour. And then, yeah, we have seven team members working on this project um, at SIMS, but also, um, yeah, six uh, chief investigators um, and a multitude of other people with, at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science that are able to um, participate or contribute to the project as well. And several, oh, well, 45 stakeholder and community events. And again, this is um, ever growing. So, yeah, that's essentially what Project Restore has been up to, and we can have any questions on that at the end, I think is the best way to do it. And yeah, we're really excited about the project. It's um, 
developing quite quickly now. We're in our second uh, round of baseline monitoring and we'll be um, actually conducting some of the restoration projects as early as this month and then be monitoring the success of the restoration um, in, at, until at least the end of 2025, hopefully um, well into the future as well. Mitch, how, um, how long do you sort of expect it to take to see a rebound in the biodiversity and that sort of thing? Yeah, it's a great question. It does vary considerably um, by what the restoration technique is. Um, so, you know, the installation of um, the fish bugs, for example, uh, you can you can see fish aggregating around them relatively quickly. Um, and the living seawalls, for example, uh, you can see the benthic community take hold of those um, seawalls or, you know, um, sort of start to aggregate on them um, relatively quickly as well. And you can see upticks in biodiversity, you know, in the, in the timeline of months, for example. Um, the Posidonia translocation can take um, a bit longer. Um, so we can, we see success quite quickly in terms of um, the seagrasses that we actually plant and their survival. Um, but the long-term restoration of a seagrass meadow can be um, uh, quite a lengthy time frame. So this combination of artificial habitats, um, passive restoration, active restoration, um, this yeah, this sort of comprehensive um, method to do to performing restoration, and especially across the seascape scale, should all work together. Um, but yeah, it, it could be anywhere from. You know, seeing small positive changes in a very short time frame, but realistically it's years until um, restoration really uh, takes place to what you're, what you're hoping for in terms of meeting those reference sites or potentially, um, I, well, ideally meeting the um, standards that would have been present prior to human intervention actually making these the, or causing this damage to begin with. Okay, thanks for that. No problem. So I'm going to quickly stop sharing and then um, I'll jump over to the Seahorse one. And hopefully you can see that now as well. Yep, that looks good. Perfect. So, yeah, the other project that I work on is the Sydney Seahorse Project. So I'm currently doing my PhD on the conservation of the endangered white seahorse, Hippocampus whitei. And the Sydney Seahorse Project is part of the conservation that we initiated here at the Sydney Institute of Marine Science in the uh, back end of 2022. So a bit about the white seahorse. So they're considered to be a medium-sized seahorse species, a maximum total length of 16 centimetres. The smaller seahorses, or pygmy seahorses, are about one to two centimetres fully grown. And the largest is another species that we do find here, the potbelly seahorse, that's about 30 to 35 centimetres. And yeah, if you're measuring the seahorse total length, it includes down to their snout, and you have to stretch out their tail a little bit as well. So the white, uh, white seahorse, or Hippocampus whitei, are endemic to eastern Australia. They're found in coastal embayments and estuaries, such as Sydney Harbour. And they have a range from southeast Queensland um, down to the mid to south New South Wales coast at about Jarvis Bay. White seahorses, as per um, all seahorse species, have really high habitat association and really high site fidelity. So they're super reliant on their habitat, and I'll show you a little bit more why in a minute, but it is um, directly related to their extremely unique morphology. And then this species of seahorse has really limited home ranges and low population densities. So a single species might have a home range of 100 metres in their entire life, so really limited. Due to this high habitat association, this high site fidelity, limited home ranges and low population densities, the seahorses or the white seahorse is particularly vulnerable to habitat loss and degradation. Just a quick little bit on why they're so reliant on their habitat. 
one seahorses swim vertically and they use that little dorsal fin on their back to actually move. And as you can see, it's quite um, small. So as per, uh, in, in contrast to many fish species that swim um, horizontally and use their caudal fin um, to propel themselves or significantly larger pectoral fins, seahorses actually don't have a caudal fin whatsoever. It's um, converted into a prehensile tail and their pectoral fins are actually these little tiny fins up around their head that uh, essentially look like ears. So they're actually a really um, poor swimmer. They have a unique uh, feeding mechanism where they actually don't have a stomach and they have a fused jaw. So they use that jaw um, to suck up their prey. And because they don't have a stomach, they're feeding constantly. And a lot of this food is growing on or associated with their habitats. So, um, yeah. Sorry. So, okay. Does a fused jaw means it's not really a jaw, is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So they don't have a mandible like we do. It's essentially a, a long snout and they have this little um, mouth opening at the end. And this is um, consistent throughout the family that they exist in. So they're um, a member of Signathidae, uh, which literally means fused jaw. And that is seahorses, sea dragons and pipefish um, all have this sort of, yeah, structure on their face and yeah that's how they um suck up their food primarily shrimps for example so yeah, as i said they have these modified fins and a prehensile tail that they use to hold onto their habitats so unfortunately several of these habitats um have been lost or degraded so as i mentioned before in the project restore component um Posidonia australis is declining significantly at rates of upwards of 10 percent per year within sydney harbour and this amazingly beautiful soft coral Dendroneptheo australis at the top um, has declined really, really significantly. So it was it has been declining for over the past decade, but the floodings of 2022 um, essentially nearly wiped out the entire population that was existing uh, within Port Stephens. So it went from tens of thousands of colonies to less than 50 colonies. Now the seahorses, as you can see in these images, love these habitats. They really like, uh, have been demonstrated to have a preference towards Dendroneptheo australis and really um, utilize Pelcedonia australis as well. And because of these significant habitat loss or degradation, we've had um, significant uh, losses of seahorse populations as well. So these are upwards of 95% um, declines in the population within Port Stephens. And previously it was estimated around 50% of the um, entire populations across the range of YDI has been lost, but this is probably higher um, in recent years. As a result, the species was listed as an endangered species um, through the IUCN, and then this has been reflected in the Fisheries Management Act and the, I should say, Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. It's the second species of seahorse to be listed as endangered globally. And yeah, there's a clear need for conservation. So that's where our Sydney Seahorse Project comes in, which is a collaboration between SIMS and New South Wales DPI, University of Technology, Sydney, and supported by um, some fantastic organisations and philanthropists. And the conservation is focused on three um, key things in particular uh, for our project, but there is more conservation work being done on the White Seahorse by the New South Wales DPI as well. So firstly, we're um, conducting a conservation stocking program, which I'll tell you a fair bit more about, um, which is the captive breeding of seahorses to be released into the wild. The installation of artificial habitats or seahorse hotels and the restoration of habitats, including Dendroneptheo australis, which is currently being done by the New South Wales DPI up at Port Stephens. Um, but then down here in Sydney, we're collaborating with Project Restore and Operation Posidonia on the restoration of that endangered seagrass. So the conservation stocking program, um, it was firstly done in 2020 and you can access our paper um, there if you're interested to read a bit more. Um, but yeah, seahorses were bred and reared into Chowder Bay here where Sims is situated. Um, these seahorses are tagged with a visual implant elastomer tag. You can see the two little red tags on the juvenile seahorse in that photo. And after 12 months, we had about 20% still in the wild. And after 30, upwards of 30 months, we still had seahorses being sighted. 
demonstrating that it is a viable tool for hippocampus wide eye conservation and would potentially aid in population recovery. So we wanted to improve um, the success of this program and at SINS and under the Sydney Sea Horse Project, we've conducted some experimental rearing to improve the growth rate and survival of the species um, when they're in the aquarium with the aim that this will then improve their post-release survival. And last year we did some experiments on uh, different treatments, including temperatures, food regimes, and um, stocking densities within the aquarium and had really great survival upwards of 85% from birth to release and growth rate. We increased significantly and were able to release the seahorses within three and a half months. Um, previously, it would have taken about six to seven months to get them to a suitable size that we can tag and that they would likely survive out in the wild. So that's a not very good photo, but a photo that demonstrates um, the size difference between seahorses um, when they're reared uh, well, when the rearing is optimized. So this, the seahorse on the left was um, at a stocked at 25 degrees and fed with enriched food. And the seahorse on the right, for example, was um, stocked at 19, uh, housed at 19 degrees and fed with non-enriched food. And these two seahorses were literally born on the same day. They're part of the same brood. And you can see the significant size difference that um, the appropriate aquarium or husbandry techniques can have. So we released 384 seahorses into Chowder Bay last year. 300 of these seahorses were tagged using the visual implant elastomer tag, as I mentioned before, and you can see the green tag on this um, seahorse here. And we are monitoring these seahorses um, for 12 months post-release. I actually just finished as of um, a week ago, the 12 months post-release for uh, post-release monitoring for this group. And um, yeah, the results have been really positive. We've also had citizen scientists contributing to the monitoring by taking photos and submitting it to the iNaturalist platform. Yeah, as I said, we had really great success in this iteration. So um, roughly 50 seahorses captured on every dive. I had 52 recaptured out of 300 on the final dive 12 months post-release. And we've seen varied habitat utilization, but they particularly like these swimming nets uh, in Chowder Bay and throughout Sydney Harbour. And this is in an absence of some of their more, um, well, what would be their natural habitats. Great citizen science. Yep. So you've released three hundred. How many are there? Mm -hmm. What's the sort of baseline? Is that um, a big chunk of the population, or for the natural baseline? Yeah. Yeah. So um, we haven't done full population estimates um, it, it recently, but when I'm um, when I'm doing the monitoring, I record the number of wild seahorses as well. So in the standardized search area and standardized time of our seahorse monitoring, as I said, we roughly capture um, 50 of our seahorses on any given dive. And um, off the top of my head without looking, the most that we've caught of wild seahorses in the same area is 18. Um, but yeah, it's roughly yeah about 18 to 20. Um, so realistically, that's like two and a half times the um, natural population that was there. Yeah. And some really great um, reproductive success as well. So this um, seahorse, if you can see my cursor there, um, is one of our uh, seahorses with the orange tag um, there on the side and a nice big brooding pouch, um, which means it is actually pregnant in the wild. So um, on an, one single dive in January at the back end of their breeding season, a 20 individual captive bred seahorses pregnant in the wild. So hopefully um, leading to um, reproduction and increase in the population as well. So yeah, as we said, um, habitat loss is the key contributing factor to why seahorses or the white seahorse has declined and these are seahorse hotels, a concept established by Dr. Dave Parasti, who's my supervisor up at Port Stevens. And essentially these are metal cages that are um, installed onto 
these sand flats, which would have previously been um, seagrass meadows or um, areas in which uh, soft corals were established and um, sponge gardens. So for, and over time, they end up looking a bit more like the Seahorse Hotel on the right there, where they get all of this um, amazing biofouling, um, algae is, macroalgae is sponges accumulating on them. And the seahorses will be able to utilize them as habitat. It provides the seahorses with um, somewhere to hide. And especially for our juveniles, when we release, we see them able to um, sort of avoid predation as well and provides the seahorses with food with the, the amphipods and copepods, for example, that um, utilize the structures. And then some of the habitat restoration, including the collaboration with Operation Posidonia on the rest on the transplanting or um, planting of Posidonia, including upcoming planting with Project Restore. And the New South Wales DPI doing some great work on the transplanting of soft corals. And yeah, as with Project Restore, having an impact on the community is um, really important as well in terms of um, yeah, getting the community on board and encouraging the development of awareness of what goes on underwater and how we can play a role in uh, addressing some of the significant issues and what we can do to um, reverse some of these problems and hopefully restore habitats and restore or assist in um, repopulating some of these threatened species as well. And yeah, just recently in June and July this year, we've released another 475 seahorses and we'll continue the monitoring on these guys um, into the future. So yeah, that's kind of where the Sydney Seahorse Project is at and yeah, aiming to um, yeah, continue to develop the uh, methods uh, for the conservation of the species and hopefully um, establish or see that we are having a positive effect on the wild populations of the endangered white seahorse. Uh, yeah, thank you. And I'll stop sharing now. Fantastic. Thanks, Mitch. Okay, I just need to zip through. I should have been doing these as we went. Apologies. We have some early bird questions, which we'll be getting to in a couple of seconds. There we go. Okay, first question. Has there been any, been any research on biochar being added to seawater? Is it a permanent carbon sink? Does the biochar re-enter the cycle? I guess, how, are you using biochar, Mitch? Good, good question. Um, I had never heard of biochar before that question was asked, <laughs> but I did do a couple of quick Googles and I saw that there has been some um, research done with it in aquatic systems that looks quite promising. Um, that research was quite recent. Um, it does seem, and I can see another one in the question chat here. And yet, it, yeah, it seems like it's been pretty well proven to remove a lot of um, chemical runoff and microplastics. So, so yeah, I'd, I'd be interested to look into it more. I think in general with these sorts of interventions, though, if you're thinking about using this on a large scale, then you really want to do thorough experimentation to see what sort of the long-term effects of it are, what the scalability of it is, what the implementation is of that kind of scalability. But it does look like quite an exciting product. And I even read that uh, it's, it's used quite a bit for agricultural purposes and that they use... Uh, sort of natural um, rack or uh, different uh, oceanic waste that's washed up on shorelines to create that. So yeah, very cool. Thanks for mentioning it. It's uh, interesting to know. All right, question number two, please provide details on how they came up with the best design for seahorse uptake and long-term occupancy recruitment. Yeah, great question. Um, so there's been a few different seahorse hotel designs. So to paint the picture a little bit, um, the idea was formed out of um, 
the observation by um, Dr. David Harassi of seahorses utilizing um, discarded fish traps as habitat. So um, people had less, left their fish traps behind and over time these had fouled up and the seahorses had actually started to use these as habitats, especially in places where the habitat had been lost or degraded. So the original seahorse hotels that were restored in Port Stevens were made out of aluminium. And um, then we saw that they broke down um, too, too quickly. So uh, they were very effective in seahorses um, utilizing them initially, but they started to break down too quickly. Um, and then we used galvanized steel and unfortunately, this was the opposite end of the scale. So they, um, the accumulation of growth was a bit too slow. So of course, we we're like stuck in a bit of a Goldilocks issue there that had to find the midpoint. Um, so we're now using a Rio mesh as the structure, or Rio steel. Um, and from what we've seen so far, this is working like really efficiently in terms of the accumulation of growth and the rate of breakdown um, working really well. And that photo that I had earlier of that seahorse hotel covered in sponges and um, algae, which is the sort of, yeah, prototype of what a seahorse hotel long-term should be, um, was made out of this Rio mesh and seems to be working really um, effectively in terms of um, achieving what we're looking for. And yeah, so this is shown um, great long-term success for the seahorses. And the occupancy um, does change a little bit. They do um, move back and forth between their natural habitats as well. Um, but yeah, we've seen that this uh, material that we're using currently pr promotes how long or how well the seahorses will uh, utilize the hotels. Those photos you showed of that um, seahorse hotel that it was covered in sponges, etc. how long had that one been in there? Is that just uh, no, I think that one was about three years at that point in time for the photo. Um, but yeah, so you'll get enough growth within about three months that the seahorses will really start to utilize it. The seahorses can use it from day one, essentially, because they'll start, they want something to hold on to when you have that structure that they can hold on to. But it's about three months that you have enough fouling that the seahorses can actually effectively camouflage um, with the uh, material that has encrusted upon the hotels and that will bring their food as well. So that leads to um, them staying or using it for uh, a longer longer time period. So as that um, reinforcing steel rusts out, mm -hmm. you'll be left with sort of residual pile of sponges and other things. Is that yeah, exactly the, the long term habitat after that? That that will stay there as that, or yeah, exactly. So you're providing that sort of foundational. Um, yeah, that foundation for the habitat to establish itself upon um, these habitat forming organisms that are algae and bivalves and sponges and things like that. And essentially, yeah, that metal should um, corrode away and you're left with what is relatively a semi-natural reef. And yeah, there's still uh, a significant need for natural habitat restoration as well. So the Seahorse Hotels uh um, part of that in terms of providing habitat, but yeah, habitat restoration is important as well. So you still want natural restoration to take place. Yeah. All right. Next question. What impacts are litter and weeds having on Sydney Harbour? Interesting question. I mean, yeah, I, I, like the, the amount of uh, human waste in the ocean is quite profound and pretty well documented, I guess I would say. Um, you know, microplastics are a major issue. Um, all of those, you know, we, we sort of say when it comes to plastics, especially in marine waste, um, they don't they don't break up, they break down, or they don't break down, they break up. I can't remember, but the point is they never disappear. They just break into smaller and smaller pieces, which, um, yeah, have pretty phenomenal impacts on marine systems. I could go on and on about that. Weeds, I'm not sure what you're getting at there, but, um, you know, we do do a lot of research on uh, urban runoff. Um, obviously, a large part of our focus is restoration um, and research on 
urban marine areas and the effects that human impacts can have on those areas. So, you know, we do quite a lot of research actually about, you know, pesticides, um, uh, fertilizers, and when they run off during rainwater events, how that affects local systems, just as well pharmaceuticals, um, which people usually pass through urination because um, the majority of it's not absorbed in your system, you know. Um, so runoff generally has a massive impact, especially on urban marine areas. And it is something that is, you know, uh, quite a major threat to local local ecosystems. Andrew, you mentioned during your presentation the um, toxicity, biotoxins from the algal blooms. Mm -hmm. um, and we sort of view that more as a, well, I've always thought of it as more of an inland water issue, but those toxins, do they ultimately affect the marine life as well? Do they discharge down? Are they? Yeah, of course. I mean, so those organisms, first of all, they're actually a, a plant phytoplankton species called dinoflagellates. They're a really amazing organism. They're sort of like little aliens. And there's actually some pretty good debate within the scientific community still about where they fall phylogenetically. And a large portion of the scientific community doesn't actually think that they have a place on the phylogenetic tree that we know of. Um, so they're sort of like these little alien creatures that produce these these little alien plants that produce these crazy biotoxins. And and yeah, so the two major issues that come from those algal blooms in general can be positive and negative. They can be especially negative in sort of near coastal estuarine areas where there's not as much water exchange because they can actually consume so much oxygen that they suffocate local systems. From the toxicology perspective, um, they create massive impacts on local systems through biomagnification. So something eats this tiny planktonic plant, something eats a lot of it, then something eats that organism that was eating it, and then those toxins concentrate and accumulate to the point where they can become deadly to that animal and even, you know, deadly or potentially harmful to humans at the top of the food chain. You know, if you eat a salmon that's eaten, you know, fish that have been feeding on smaller fish that have been feeding on those phytoplankton and that salmon can be at a point where it's still alive but barely and its flesh is quite toxic for consumption right so they're very persistent compounds these biotoxins yeah yeah it actually it's 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 a bit of a blessing when it comes to the research because it's almost <laughs> impossible to break down these molecules so you know usually when you're doing chemical extractions and chemical work you know you're worried about uh, your samples getting overheated or too cold or getting exposed to different things. But these biotoxins, man, like, yeah, you could just about put them in the microwave and still do a pretty meaningful analysis on them. Well, that's good news, Andrew. I think we might move on to the next question. Um, okay. How does the project protect seahorses from further illegal poaching for aquarium trade? and medicinal purposes? Yeah, good question. So on the global scale, this illegal poaching for aquarium trade and medicinal purposes, as well as uh, bottom trawling, is actually the biggest threat to seahorses. Um, here, we at the Sydney Seahorse Project um, don't directly uh, focus on this as an issue currently, but it is something that is enforced by um, the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, as well as other government agencies um, around the country. So for us, this is not part of our current research focus, being a relatively new project on a smallish team, but yeah, it is enforced by government. It is um, managed through yeah the New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, and there's yeah um, significant fines for individuals that are um, caught intervening or possessing a seahorse and there's plenty of signage in uh that has been um installed recently especially at known white seahorse locations um to inform the public as well but yeah it is a prevalent issue internationally and globally that um is being yeah researched and yeah hopefully uh tackled by um yeah a, a range of organizations on a on a larger scale Okay, question number five. How are the multitude of potential variables controlled in a valid scientific way, therefore randomly chosen site? 
Yeah, interesting question. So any anything that <laughs> really occurs in the wild is really difficult to um, control what, as you, as the question asker said, the multitude of potential variables. There's so much that goes on in the ocean in specific ecosystems, and it can be difficult to um, control these in uh a scientific way uh, random randomly selecting a site is not possible um, because you are the sites that seahorses are released or the sites that seahorse hotels are installed have to meet the sort of parameters or metrics that would allow seahorses to live there to begin with so if you're randomly selecting a location you might um yeah you might pick the wrong location essentially that doesn't provide the seahorses with the um sort of fundamental requirements that they have as a species um so yeah the the potential variables are controlled on a sort of study by study basis so it depends on what each question um for each sort of small component of the project is asking and yeah determining how these variables do affect it um through yeah i guess identifying what you're what you're trying to research at the time specifically and yeah how you can best control that um in a, what is always going to be a difficult environment being uh research conducted in the ocean and in estuaries that do such as sydney harbour that does have um ver these uh environmental variables that do change quite drastically mm. Yeah, I mean, with the seahorse project, we're trying to repopulate them. So we need to find a place where they can live happily. With Project Restore, you're looking at, you know, a multitude of sites where you do, you use control sites um, to control for, you know, pseudo replication and variable, et cetera, et cetera. But the sites that we're um, enacting interventions on, you know, we're trying to choose sites where we think that they'll be successful, where they have a good sort of, relational um, comparison to the control sites and where we have a good chance of getting permission because there's a whole lot of permitting and licensing and all sorts of different government organizations that and local councils and things that we have to have permission from and you know even just across sydney harbor some are super supportive and some are you know a bit more difficult to reckon with at least uh now while the project is young so yeah that's a pretty common uh thing that's raised on these webinars with, with the Malone Institute, the cost of approvals and sort of negotiating them to install their leaky weirs was as much as actually installing the weirs themselves. So, yeah. So I think they could be fixed up by the sounds of it. Yeah. Well, another interesting thing for us, which is worth mentioning for anyone who, um, yeah, might have a, a easy path to a minister. We actually just met with the ED of DQ uh, earlier this week, who's helping us a lot with this. But what, what's really interesting is all the permitting that we do for these restoration interventions, they still fall under development applications. There's actually no pathway at all for restoration. Um, and so it makes it quite difficult for us to even fill out these paperwork and, you know, to say that we don't need to do an environmental impact assessment because we'll be uh, assessing how well it improves the local environment, not how it degrades the local environment. So we're working a lot to petition local governments and federal governments to create pathways for restoration because it, it is just something that's sort of left out of the, the current structure of things. I'll have a chat to you afterwards, Andrew, that introduced to the Malone Institute. They've been very successful with their legal I've got a sort of legal advisory team in getting policy changed. So they've had a few wins there. Cool. Worth a chat. Number six, do the guests at the hotels need more than just the hotel? <laughs> Therefore, what about the nearby littoral zones? 
Yeah, well, they definitely need a receptionist and, you know, a, a, a clerk to help them plan their activities for the day. Sorry, go ahead, Mitch. <laughs> yeah, fortunately, these ones are all inclusive. So brings their food, brings them places to sleep, brings them everything that they realistically need. But yeah, the, the question is correct. Um, the nearby zones have to be um, suitable as well. And ideally, the Seahorse Hotels would work in unison with um, either natural habitat or... Um, the, the restoration activities taking place to um, provide more than just, yeah, the single hotels by themselves It should give the opportunity for the seahorses to move um, between the hotels and these natural habitats. Um, so yeah, it is important to have the hotels installed in areas where um, one, the seahorses would naturally exist and two, in um, it can be more successful when they are posting relatively close proximity to existing or um, potentially restored habitats. Just like humans, like a bit of both. <laughs> um, all right, we're going to move to the questions raised during... Are you guys happy to keep going for another 15 minutes or so? Good yeah, hey, I'm happy to. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, first question is from James Stewart. Great work. Thank you for sharing. Always carbon is aware biochar can filter PFAS and microplastics from water. Are PFAS and microplastics damaging for sea life? Are you seeing it having an effect? Yes. Uh, PFAS is a major issue. That's an industrial runoff. Microplastics, of course, as well. Um, yeah, we... we I guess we did already answer a biochar question earlier, but but yeah, those are two majorly deleterious um, yeah human waste products. Um, and yeah, I could go into great detail about all the different ways that microplastics are affecting local systems, but um, uh, we probably don't have time for that. And there's quite there's a good amount of um, easily attainable um, information of that online. Very easily indeed. We I have a whole nother presentation just on microplastics, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> and and Hydrotera has a webinar that uh, was done by, oh, God, I've forgotten their name. Um, but there is one on microplastics in the seas worth hunting up if you want to find them. They're on our website. Um, next question from Tom Onus. You mentioned that seagrass is degrading it. 10% per year, what are the causes? And is anything being done to address these? I think you guys are doing something. Yeah, I mean, human activity is a major cause. Uh, like the seagrasses occur in shallow coastal areas where they have access to light um, via a uh, you know, shallow water column. And so moorings, as Mitch mentioned before, are a major impact, as is just anchoring, recreational anchoring. Um, which is why there are marine protected zones where people are not supposed to anchor, though they still often do. Um, one of the cool aspects of Project Restore, which Mitch may want to speak to more, and we also have an ongoing collaboration with CSIRO, where we're uh, working to design and test what are called smart, uh, environmentally friendly moorings. Um, and these environmentally friendly moorings essentially um, keep the chain off of the sea floor. Um, so the chain is floating in the water column and that eliminates the uh, ability for the chain to be dragged across the sea floor and to um, degrade a, a large area around the mooring itself. Um, I mean, I would also like to cite that, I mean, I'm sure that it's a great process and that it's quite proactive by the city of Sydney, but they cyclically on an annual basis service every single mooring in the harbor. Um, I would personally see that as probably a bit overkill, although I understand the liabilities and things involved, but, you know, they're picking those up, which is causing, you know, surrounding areas to be buried in sediment, and then they're dropping them again, which is, you know, creating a bit of a plume of sediments and again, burying surrounding benthic systems. So um, I wonder if there could be sort of some, uh, yeah, policy in place to sort of, yeah, minimize or optimize that process. Um, funnily enough, a lot of boat owners also don't like it because oftentimes after they service the moorings, the first big storm that you get, the mooring gets dragged around if your boat's attached to it, and that can often put your uh, your boat in peril. So, yeah, smart. I think uh, environmentally friendly moorings are, you know, if we're able to 
um, you know, hone in on that technology and get them instituted across the harbor it would make a massive, massive difference to um, local ecosystems. Okay, next question from James Stewart. When there are bushfires and charcoal is washed into the sea, how long does the charcoal persist? Does it filter the water or is it harmful? I mean, that's a pretty cool question, I guess. The short answer to that is, is that, you know, the ash from bushfires um, going into the sea is almost nature's way of offsetting the carbon that comes from the bushfires because that creates a massive nutrient input, which is proven to show massive um, algal blooms. Um, you know, there can be too much of a good thing. Uh, we, we said before how algal blooms can be detrimental, but, you know, in open water, I think actually after the big bushfires of 2019 or something like that, there was some crazy figure, which I can't remember exactly, so don't quote me on this, but they were saying that the amount of algal blooms caused by the ash from that bushfire was something, was like relatively similar to sort of the entire Saharan desert becoming a grassland for like like however many weeks or months or something like that. So so yeah, it's a it's actually a very natural cycle and it's actually overall I'd say it's positive for marine environments that nutrient input. Presumably these are algal blooms without those biotoxins in them, Andrew. Mm -hmm. They're they're probably more more coccolithophores than dinoflagellates, if that means anything to you. Not a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um Next question from Alana Gaspari. What other species have you observed using the seahorse hotels? Oh, plenty, for sure. Yeah, there are um, yeah, a quite considerable number of fish species. We use them. Um, we see a lot of um, cephalopods, so octopus and cuttlefish, um, utilizing them. Uh, a lot of benthic predators such as um, anglerfish and frogfish, for example. Um, but yeah, essentially you're providing um, habitat that ideally the seahorse is like, um, but most fish within Sydney Harbour like, especially we see a higher quantity of juvenile fish species um, utilising the seahorse hotels um, because it is structurally complex and they are able to hide and evade predation as well um, and just as one little cool one uh, in Chowder Bay uh, recently I saw a juvenile parrotfish which is obviously not native to Sydney but would have been a, a tropical fish that's come down the East Australian current and yeah ended up feeding upon one of the seahorse hotels so just one little cool one but yeah we do see a really high um, biodiversity of um, fish species utilizing them yeah excellent okay julia nicholson she wants to get involved how do people get involved guys uh, i mean there's heaps of ways so you know you can follow us on social media and spread the word about the stuff that we're doing we are a non-profit so um you know, projects like Mitch's depend on external funding and we do take donations. I'm not trying to ask people to donate, but if you know any wealthy, you know, donors, feel free to send them our way for a tour. Um, <laughs> just as well, you know, we do take volunteers on our programs and we do, a lot of our projects are focusing on community engagement and citizen science. Um, Mitch can tell you a little bit more about that with respect to the Seahorse Project and Posidonia Collection for Project Restore, I'm sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there's yeah, definitely opportunities for citizen scientists um, to be involved in a number of the projects at SIMS, but in particular um, for the Seahorse Project, you can submit photographs of seahorses to the iNaturalist website to assist with our monitoring. Um, and then for Project Restore, as part of the translocation of um, Posidonia, so this also falls under Operation Posidonia in general, um, the the way that we're able to translocate this endangered seagrass, obviously you don't want to go ripping up seagrasses from elsewhere. Um, what we can do and what we're aiming to do currently is collecting seagrasses that have washed up, um, which does tend to happen particularly in following storm events. So after the swell of last week, um, on Monday, we just got a absolutely huge amount of Posidonia um, that was collected by a citizen scientist. 
uh, that we have collected and have brought up to um, the Sydney Institute of Marine Science into some of the aquarium facilities that Andrew demonstrated before. And these seagrasses will then be uh, replanted back into the wild, um, into some of these areas that the seagrasses have been lost. So, um, yeah, there's the opportunity for citizen scientists to um, participate in this seagrass collection. We'll soon be installing um, some drop points for the seagrass at different locations. So, yeah, as Andrew said, stay tuned to the social medias in particular for mm. Sims and Project Restore and, yeah, see how you can get involved. But, um, Join our yeah, newsletter. I, join the newsletter as well yeah got a great newsletter yeah more of this citizen science activity is going to be um kicking off in the next in the next little while so definitely now is the time to get involved and assist for sure we put on a lot of community events in fact next tuesday we're putting on an event for science week at quarantine station for anyone who's local um and i think we still have about 50 seats available it's free to attend um and the theme of that one that one is focused around our gamma initiative and the theme is um, integration of traditional knowledge into modern science. So it should be quite a cool event. Um, that, that's Tuesday at Quarantine Station at 5 p.m., I believe, with an early tour of one of the Project Restore sites at 4 p.m. What's the split of sort of government funding versus private that keeps Sims going? Um, well, as I said, so our primary operational funding comes from the universities. Um, you know, you could argue that, I mean, the universities are government funded and then they're funding us. So there's this sort of funny cyclical um, thing that's happening there. Um, Project Restore is actually the first lot of state funding that we've ever received, um, which is a bit surprising, but also exciting because hopefully that means that, you know, the project will be a great success and they'll want to continue to support us. Um, yeah, I guess... Um, yeah, I, I mean, our COO could speak much better to our financial turnovers and things, but <laughs> the majority of our funding comes from different grants and things. A lot of them are um, from, you know, ARC grants. Um, they're privately based. All of those are from Mitch's project. And then the university funding is our bread and butter. But again, I mean, you know, uh, the university funding and running the organization off of a set uh, set amount of funding um, I can tell you from firsthand experience is a huge challenge. Um, you know, we uh, not operating on a commercial basis means that we have to make everything work on a big facility and pay our staff off of that set funding. So any additional input is very much appreciated. And from a facilities perspective, especially so, because oftentimes external donors and things, they, you know, want to fund things like Mitch's fantastic work with seahorses, because um, it's sort of really clear the, you know, the return that you're getting on that investment. And that's great and well-deserved. And I'm not trying to take anything away from Mitch, but, you know, I'd like to buy some new pumps for our pump house and things like that. And it's much harder to get additional <laughs> funding or to budget to be able to buy, you know, big industrial pumps and things. So, um, so yeah, uh, yeah, but anyways, any, any support is much appreciated. Looking for a donation for some pumps or <laughs> yeah, capital expenditure. <laughs> our, our organization was started, I should say as well by a, a big federal grant, um, uh, which I think we got in 2010 or 2011. Um, so that's what built, um, our current facility as it sits today, um, but as it often happens, they built this massive facility and they didn't think towards the sort of long-term maintenance requirements and that sort of thing. So that's been the fun job for me to figure out how to sort of keep everything running and running on a world-class standard to support the research that we do. That's fantastic. Though. That sort of led to that collaboration between mm. universities. So it seems you've found a way. Good question, Julia. That went in multiple directions. <laughs> um William Kempton, do you know how white seahorses respond to being translocated from one naturally occurring habitat to another? Therefore, if they need to be translocated for maintenance works, such as a pylon or net replacement? Yeah, good question. And um, the last question from Lily is actually relatively similar on the same topic. Um, 
So I can quickly read that and then we can do them together. Sure. So Lily said, how is the maintenance and regular cleaning of sea nets in Sydney Harbour balanced with the protection of artificial habitat for hippocampus whiteii? Is there a particular frequency of net cleaning which has a minimal impact on the seahorses as possible? And how are these impacts mitigated? Um, so yes, the, there are regulations in place into how um, often or what the procedures are for the cleaning of the nets. Um, so uh, most councils are now moving away from the complete replacements of the nets to um, completely new ones because the seahorses want them to be fouled up. They want that algal growth and the associated food that comes with it. Um, but yeah, sometimes the nets do need to be um, replaced or repaired so more often now the nets are being repaired rather than a full replacement and that means that some of the net retains that biofouling that the seahorses um, do need um, but yeah it is completely controlled um, and yeah it is mitigated as best as possible when seahorses do need to be translocated for significant works they can be um, but yeah there's a considerable about, uh, amount of um, environmental variables that are out there that can affect um, the, yeah, how effective this is. Um, and yeah, it depends what is also available. Ideally, you want to move seahorses if they are being translocated for maintenance works or things like that into somewhere that's relatively close by. Um, you don't want to be moving them into completely new environments. As I said, they have a really limited home range and a really limited capacity for swimming. Um, but yeah, so there is a requirement on uh, the seahorses to be translocated to um, natural habitat within a certain distance. And if that natural habitat isn't available, then seahorse hotels, for example, may be used as an artificial habitat um, in place. And but yes, you can you can translocate them and it is often done for the for those purposes. Um, but yeah, it's just important to have a comprehensive view of um, the environment uh, to ensure that there is success in the trans in those translocations. It's often done by Mitch as well. That's actually what I think sort of one of a great sort of peripheral success of the program is um, identifying areas where seahorses are extant in the harbor and then you know during the sort of environmental impact assessment which we also often do at sims um, identifying those species and then using our team of um, you know experts in the field to um, you know do the the most practical and hopefully the the translocation of uh, seahorses and other species that could be compromised by that development um yeah in the, in the best possible with the best possible approach so that they can be um yeah replaced at the end as well and so that there's a minimum effect on local populations and local environments all right next question i was at a this is justin dury i was at a monash uni event on monday night and one researcher said Come and see me if you'd like to hear about what a platypus on Prozac looks like. Humans passing drugs, prescription and illicit into waterways are a big issue. Do you guys agree? I'd class that one as a comment, but yeah, I mean the majority <laughs> of the majority of especially higher order predators and things that you test. These days, especially in urban marine areas like Sydney Harbour, pretty much any fish you pull out of the harbour will most likely have some kind of um, pollutant detected in their tissues. Um, oftentimes, that is antibiotics and pharmaceuticals and things like that. All right. Well, our last question is an anonymous one. Um, <laughs> in Project Restore, where you are looking at improving fish habitat, how do you cope with the impact of recreational fishes diminishing your results? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question because part of the project is obviously enhancing the biodiversity and bringing back these um, species that may not be there currently, but then part of it is enhancing the abundance of fishes as well, and particularly targeting some of those fishes, like fish species that are popular for recreational activities, because this will have um, sort of ongoing positive economical um, results as well. So it's an interesting one because, yeah, ideally you want 
more people to be able to fish and fish efficiently and more sustainably. Um, so yeah, addressing the, in terms of um, diminishing the, our results is interesting. We are doing a, quite a comprehensive um, analysis on how we're affecting the ecosystem as a whole. Um, so yeah, the, the way that we're measuring this return of biodiversity is really varied and really comprehensive. So we should get a picture um, without recreational fishers having um, a significant impact. And this includes, you know, as I said before, like over a thousand GoPro, um, over a thousand GoPros being dropped already this year and over 1200 hours of footage um, to process, but also analyzing um, the sediments and preparing to analyze eDNA um, or utilize eDNA to analyze the biodiversity that exists there as well. And then also um, we're implementing an acoustic telemetry component of the project as well to see how the fish utilize the habitats and move between these habitats, especially at the sites that are being done at a seascape scale. So um, hopefully, yeah, this these multitude of different um, measurements or uh, analyses will give us the big picture with um, yeah, being impacted too much. And yeah, we want people to be able to sustainably fish as well and hope that um, the project does have a positive impact economically um, as well as from a biodiversity standpoint. Mm. I, I, I might just add to that, that, you know, you know, to wrap that up, we don't malign recreational fishers. In fact, we embrace mm -hmm. them. Um, recreational fishers, as a general rule, they love marine systems and that's their hobby. And so we try to, you know, promote collaboration and citizen science with recreational fishers. And, you know, I think another misnomer of um, marine scientists being environmental scientists is that we're, you know, uh, in radicalized environmentalists, which is not true at all. Um, you know, like a lot of the people at fisheries, some of the most senior scientists at fisheries love to eat fish, love to eat oysters. <laughs> and that's why they want to make them a sustainable fishery so that our children and, you know, people down the track and continue to eat them. So um, I'd like to think that, you know, a large subset of the population of marine scientists are quite practical people who, um, you know, embrace communities and community perspectives and are trying to work together to find that balance between, you know, maximizing uh, human uh, success and uh, enjoyment of their local marine systems while simultaneously uh, restoring, sustaining, um, and managing those marine systems in a way that allows us to continue to enjoy them and has, you know, untold economic and other benefits for humanity. Sounds like a good source for donations, I reckon, Andrew, those <laughs> fishes. Um, look, that brings us to an end of our webinar. Really just want to thank both Andrew and Mitch for putting on a fantastic presentation. I think the Sims uh, is doing an amazing job and, you know, hats off to you. It's fantastic to see some proactive restoration going on. Um, Andrew, I'll introduce you to the Malone Institute. I think there's some really interesting parallels there um, which could help you with your getting some of that policy stuff out of the way that um, can get in the way of installing these things. But thank you very much, both of you. It was really, really entertaining. No worries. Thank you, Richard. Thank you for the opportunity. And thanks again to Jane for organizing. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks. Cheers, guys.